terror in Christchurch. This is one of New Zealand's darkest days. At least 49 people are dead in mass shootings at two mosques during Friday prayers. We have the latest, including world reaction. Suspending talks? A top North Korean official speaks about the breakdown between their country and the United States. Family leave plan. A new proposal would allow new parents to tap into their social security. We'll tell you how it would work. And devotion to Our Lady. As Pope Francis wraps up his annual retreat, we take a look at the town where it was held and its connection to Mary. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, March 15, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. Our top story tonight, tragedy in New Zealand. At least 49 people are dead after mass shootings at two mosques full of worshipers attending Friday prayers. One man, a self-proclaimed racist, wielded at least two assault rifles and a shotgun. New Zealand's Prime Minister calling it one of the darkest days in her country's history. Clearly what has happened here is an extraordinary and unprecedented act of violence. Dozens of deaths after shootings at two mosques Friday afternoon, local time. I have never could believe that something like this would ever happen in the city of Christchurch, but actually I would never believe that this would ever happen in New Zealand. One witness said he was inside the mosque when the shooting began and heard the gunman, quote, continuously shooting for 10 to 15 minutes. A journalist also heard the shots. What I did was basically waiting for that and praying to God, oh God, please, no, let this guy run out of bullets. The injured were taken to the hospital for medical treatment. The injuries ranging from gunshot wounds to the, you know, the head and face and um, arms, legs and torso um, and soft tissue injuries. Officials in U.S. cities, including Los Angeles, Minneapolis and New York, say they're adding extra security around mosques out of an abundance of caution. New Zealand police say the suspect is believed to be a 28-year-old Australian. He's been charged with murder. Two other armed suspects were taken into custody while police try to determine what role they played. The 28-year-old left a 74-page manifesto on social media and used what may have been a helmet camera to live stream on Facebook the attack at the Al Noor Mosque. Police did not immediately say whether the same person was responsible for both shootings. Reaction to the attack is pouring in from around the world. The Vatican says Pope Francis is deeply saddened to learn of the senseless acts of violence. In a telegram, the Vatican Secretary of State writes, Pope Francis assures all New Zealanders, and in particular the Muslim community, of his heartfelt solidarity in the wake of these attacks. Queen Elizabeth II, who is New Zealand's head of state, said in a message to the country she was deeply saddened by the appalling events in Christchurch and sent condolences to families and friends of victims. The Queen also paid tribute to emergency services and volunteers supporting the injured. She added, at this tragic time, my thoughts and prayers are with all New Zealanders. President Trump tweeted this morning, my warmest sympathy and best wishes goes out to the people of New Zealand after the horrible massacre in the mosques. 49 innocent people have so senselessly died with so many more seriously injured. The U.S. stands by New Zealand for anything we can do. God bless all. We will continue to follow the terror attack in New Zealand. President Trump is also reacting to senators rebuking his national emergency declaration. This afternoon, he issued his very first veto. Yesterday, a dozen Republicans joined Democrats in a resolution against the president's use of executive power to fund a border wall. Still, the president's veto doesn't guarantee he'll get the money he wants. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. That's because court challenges will likely stall the president's push for more border wall funding. President Trump did allow cameras inside the Oval Office today when he kicked back what he called a reckless resolution from Congress. Today I am vetoing this resolution. Congress has the freedom to pass this resolution, and I have the duty to veto it, and I'm very proud to veto it. President Trump reprimands Congress with his first veto. He's trying to protect his national emergency declaration over border security, but his demand for more wall funding may not get very far. 
it will likely be choked in court challenges. Still, his signature today shows support for a campaign promise to build the wall. We either have a country or we don't. We either have borders or we don't. Uh, the wall is very important. We asked the top White House official today if politics helped push today's veto pen. Does the president believe he'll gain political points by signing this veto? Gaining political, the president's doing what he believes is his constitutional duty, which is that to protect the American people. So there's, there's no political gain in signing this veto? This is about doing the right thing, which is that of protecting the American people, keeping us safe, and also helping to gain operational control of the southern border. Right now, Congress doesn't have the votes to override the president's veto, but the arguments against the border wall continue. Constituents don't want a wasteful, needless, reckless wall, a vanity project that the president has made a central issue about himself. One Republican senator, Mitt Romney, who voted against the president's national emergency, says this is not about the president. Instead, the balance of power that is core to the Constitution. Why? Mark, are we hearing Catholic bishops weigh in on any of this? Well, previously, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops expressed deep concern the national emergency circumvents Congress. Now, separately today, the USCCB is backing legislation offering citizenship to certain migrants who have been living in the U.S. with temporary protections, Wyatt. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. It's a question you'll hear on the campaign trail. Should parents get paid time off after giving birth or adopting a child? President Trump, in his State of the Union, urged Congress to pass the paid family leave. Democrats have pushed their own plans, and now Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey tells us about a new Republican proposal that would allow parents to do just that. You're going to tell your big brother that you came to the park today? Patrice Sanwuka welcomed baby Jesse in December. Her employer, the Independent Women's Forum, gave her paid maternity leave. Her husband also got that time off. It takes time to recover for your body to really get that rest. Uh, and then for bonding with this little guy, I mean, learning how we, how he works, what, what his different cries mean. That I needed time just dedicated at home alone to do. And More than 80% of moms and dads don't get paid family leave. That's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This week, two Republican senators introduced a plan yeah. to give working parents that chance. The, the crux of this bill is to provide for that bonding time uh, for mom and dad to spend that time with their, their newborn infant or an adoptive child. Uh, and again, providing for greater outcomes in the long run. Their plan would allow people to tap into their Social Security benefits after giving birth or adopting. In return, they delay their future Social Security retirement pay. It will be budget neutral. As it's set up, um, the way it would work is you take a month of the earned leave benefit uh, in exchange for two months of delayed retirement or two months in exchange for four months or three months in exchange for six months. But Democratic Senator and presidential candidate Kirsten Gillibrand criticizes the proposal. It only covers new parents and it creates a false choice between Social Security and paid leave. When we think about how Social Security was created and why it was created in 1935, the idea was to be able to provide funds for workers when they would need it, potentially at retirement. The person who needs the benefit is actually funding it themselves. There is no new tax on business, no new tax on taxpayers. For Patrice, it's important to help other parents have the time to do this. Please come out so he can play with you, Mr. Sun, Mr. Golden Sun. The Republican senator's proposal doesn't increase taxes, and it's just a draft. Now, one criticism I've heard is of estimates. Social Security in 75 years will be underfunded by roughly $15 trillion. So, Wyatt, the question is, is this really the time to allow even more people to take money out? Well, Jason, what other plans have lawmakers suggested? Critic of the Republicans, Democratic presidential candidate uh, Kirsten Gillibrand is backing another family leave proposal. It would pay for the leave with a new payroll, payroll tax. Now, hers is likely to pass in the House, but not the Senate. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi reporting. Thanks, Jason. An official in North Korea says leader Kim Jong-un is rethinking whether to continue diplomatic talks with the United States. Pyongyang's vice foreign minister also says the U.S. threw away a golden opportunity at the most recent summit last month in Vietnam. He calls President Trump's negotiating position eccentric. 
but adds the relationship overall between the leaders remains strong. Cross-border fighting between Israel and Gaza's ruling Hamas group is winding down, but not before Israeli warplanes struck roughly 100 targets overnight. This footage shows the wreckage left by the airstrikes. Officials say four people were wounded. The blasts were in response to a rare rocket attack into Tel Aviv last night. Israeli media now says the strike on the city was mis misfire. A team from Ethiopian Airlines begins its analysis of the voice recorder from the plane that crashed last Sunday. All 157 people on board were killed. The New York Times reports the pilot requested in a panicky voice to return to the airport just minutes after takeoff. Prime Minister Theresa May is trying to save a deal for Britain's exit from the European Union. Parliament yesterday voted to ask the EU to postpone the move for several weeks. For now, it remains scheduled for March 29th. May is trying to convince pro-Brexit members of her Conservative Party to accept a deal they do not like. She says it's better than the alternatives, leaving without a deal or remaining in the EU. Coming up, Human Rights Report. We asked the Special Advisor for Religious Minorities at the State Department about the situation around the world, plus his reaction to the deadly mosque shootings in New Zealand. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. China defends its human rights record after the United States says the communist country is in a league of its own when it comes to abuse against its own citizens. A Chinese government spokesman dismissed the State Department's report, calling it full of ideological prejudice. This week, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo cited China's repression of Christians and the mass detentions of more than one million Muslims as examples of the abuse. Joining us now is Knox Thames, Special Advisor for Religious Minorities, speaking to us from the State Department. Knox, welcome back to the program. Before we discuss the Human Rights Report, I'd like to get your reaction to the deadly mosque shootings in New Zealand. Uh, it was horrific. Uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to the impacted families in those communities. Uh, it was just pure evil. Uh, places of worship should be safe havens, not places where innocents are murdered. Um, so we our hearts go out to them and we're watching the situation very closely. I know our viewers agree with you on that. Turning now to this week's release of the department's human rights report, Secretary Mike Pompeo called out China specifically for the persecution of religious and ethnic minorities. You've spoken about the Chinese government's labor camps. Explain to us what they're doing and why do you think the situation doesn't appear to be getting any better? Well, we're extremely concerned about the situation in Xinjiang, uh, which is in far western China. Uh, the majority population comes from the Uyghur Muslim community. It's an ethnic and religious minority. Uh, the Chinese policy for decades, really, has been one of repression, one of limiting religious freedom, preventing children from going to mosque, uh, preventing parents from even naming their children Mohammed, uh, preventing communities from participating in Ramadan, the, one of the most holy times of the year for Muslims. Uh, in the past uh, year or two, we've seen uh, an alarming uptick in repression with Chinese authorities really trying to eradicate any independent religious activity from that community. We're deeply concerned and we're speaking out about it. Let's turn now, because earlier this month you tweeted a picture of Shabazz Bhatti uh, saying in his photo actually sits in your office. Tell us who Shabazz Bhatti was and why do you think he's a person who had a lot of courage, as you say? Well, he was my friend. He was a courageous advocate for Christians and other religious minorities in Pakistan. And I think, in my personal opinion, he's a modern-day martyr. Uh, he was killed by the Pakistani Taliban for his outspoken advocacy for Asia Bibi and other religious minorities in Pakistan. He paid the ultimate price, but I'm keep his picture in my office to just encourage me to, to challenge me to do everything I can, to challenge our team in our office, to do everything we can to ensure that people, regardless of what they believe, are protected from harm and have this inalienable human right of freedom of conscience fully respected. And of course, our viewers have a deep respect for Shabazz Bhatti as a Catholic as well. Knox Thames, Special Advisor for Religious Minorities, talking to us from the State Department today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Wyatt. Lawmakers in Kentucky send a heartbeat bill to the state governor. It would ban abortions once a fetal heartbeat is detected, sometimes as early as six weeks. 
The ACLU says it plans to file a lawsuit against the proposal. Yesterday, the group filed a suit trying to block a different pro-life measure in Kentucky, one that bans abortion on the basis of gender, race, or if the baby is disabled. Up next, Pope Francis concludes his annual spiritual exercises. We'll take a look at the Marian connection to the town where the retreat was held. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. This week, federal prosecutors charged 50 people in the nation's largest college admissions bribery scandal. Prominent business leaders and Hollywood celebrities, including actresses Lori Lawlin and Felicity Huffman, were charged in the case. Prosecutors say there could be more indictments to come. Join me now via Skype from North Carolina to take a look at this from a Catholic perspective is Kelly Solomon, director of the Newman Guide programs for the Cardinal Newman Society. Kelly, we're talking about very wealthy people involved in this bribery scandal, literally buying their children's way into college, falsifying academic athletic records. What do you think this says about the integrity of college admissions process that this has been occurring regularly? Yes, Wyatt, this is great to be with you, but this is a sad and terrible story. I mean, these families are willing to bribe, cheat, lie, whatever it takes to get into these elite colleges. And it's sad and disappointing, but this is a good opportunity for Catholic families to step back and think about our priorities in the college church. Are we so desperate to get that big name on our resumes, or are there other considerations we should be thinking about? Some of the students didn't even know that their parents were involved in this scheme. What do you think are the moral implications of parents deceiving their own children in this way? I mean, what a terrible lesson. College should be all about educating students in truth and wisdom. And yet these parents have violated virtues and they are setting a terrible lesson and a terrible example for their children. What do you think we as Catholics should think about as we go through the college application process, as we think about selecting colleges and universities? You know, we have to be focused on the most important things. It's all about sainthood, right? Not Stanford. We have to focus on educating our students, finding ways for them to find a place where they can grow in body, mind, and soul. I personally experience a faithful Catholic college education and I'm thrilled with all that it's given me. It's where I met my husband. It's where I received a strong liberal arts education. It's where I grew in my faith. You know, Catholic families, this is this scandal brings to light. We've got to be focused on those important things. There's this fraud of these colleges are held up as the prestigious colleges, but are they really that prestigious? The Ivy League colleges, they were founded to give Christian formation, but we see so often that that's not the case today. I mean, one of the, one of the colleges involved in this was Georgetown. Again, there have been Catholic identity abuse after Catholic identity abuse at Georgetown. So is it really considered one of those elite colleges where you should send your children and Will it prepare them for not only this life, but the one to come? You do a lot of research on various colleges and putting together the annual Newman Guide. What do you look for to make sure the colleges you recommend are following the rules? Well, I talked to several admissions leaders this week, and they were sad and disappointed about this, and they're going to be doing everything possible to assure families that they will take their Catholic identity seriously in everything they do. When we put colleges in the Newman Guide, it's because they're following what the church expects of colleges. As laid out by Pope St. John Paul the Great uh, in Ex Cordiae Ecclesiae and by other magisterial documents. You know, John Paul II focused so much on how we can find the fullness of truth if we're willing to engage with faith and reason. That's what students can find at real faithful Catholic colleges, and sadly, not so often at these elite or other prestigious colleges. Very important values indeed. Kelly Solomon, director of the Newman Guide for Programs for the Cardinal Newman Society, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you, Wyatt. Pope Francis ends his nearly week-long retreat today outside Rome by thanking the retreat's spiritual leader. The Holy Father says the Benedictine monk's meditations focused on seeing God in all humanity. The group discussed the importance of hope, work, and patience. Pope Francis says the virtues help carry us forward. The city where Pope Francis attended the retreat is Aricha. It's been used as the spot for the annual Lenten retreat since 2014. EWTN Rome Bureau Chief Alan Holdren has a look at the city 16 miles south of Rome. Our Lady of Galoro is one of the first shrines dedicated to the Immaculate Conception, and devotion to her here in Aricia, Italy, dates back centuries. 
della Madonna di Galoro ha radici molto antiche. Father Andrea, the shrine's rector, says the Madonna has always granted many graces and miracles to the faithful. Il ritrovamento ha davvero del miracoloso perché... According to tradition, a child discovered the image of Mary which survived a fire in the first week of Lent. The local people immediately believed it to be miraculous. Antonio Deli Castelli, a local historian, says all of its architecture highlights the Immaculate Conception, or Mary's being conceived without original sin. He says Pope Pius IX, who declared the Immaculate Conception a dogma in 1854, visited the church often. Popes have been frequent pilgrims to this holy site due to its proximity to the papal summer residence of Castle Gandolfo. Pope Francis, who makes his Lenten retreat here each year, has put Ariccia on the map again, making it once again the destination for popes. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EWTN News Nightly. Our thanks to Alan Holdren for that report. A lot of Catholic history there. And that wraps up our newscast for tonight. We thank you for watching. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back on Monday with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.